First Thessalonians, that's easy for me to say, First Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 9. We did all of verse 8 last week. And just so you know, that will not be on the recordings because somehow the audio got turned off on the computer. So it, it, no, last week I was for verse eight. I was I was up here. And that would be a pretty boring video. <laughs> no, I'm not saying. I, I don't know. There's a mute thing on it, and I don't know who did it. It could have been me. It could have been her. I don't know. I'll, I don't stand here and yell at myself. I would look like an idiot if I did. Um, so I. Well, yeah. <laughs> yours is on. Yes, yes, yours is good. I noticed it between the two and turned it on. And so yours is good. As a matter of fact, it's on as of this morning. So it's it's all up. Uh, this week, hopefully that won't happen. So uh, enough. Last week we were looking at um, the fact that the people who reject what is being taught were not rejecting Paul, Silvanus, or Timothy. They were rejecting God and how that holds true even today in, in our lives. Um, we can work with people indefinitely. Let me illustrate that with this. This is kind of kind of important because it kind of ties in, even though we're starting a new a new thought. Um, I've worked with people in cults for many, 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 many years. To the best of my knowledge, I've not seen a single one come to Christ. Okay, I I don't know that any have. There may have been some that did it after the fact. Best of my knowledge, that hasn't been the case. I've, I've watched a lot of videos from oh, uh, James White, um, oh, names are slipping my mind right now. All you have to do is just say the, you know, show them these verses and they'll come to Christ. Yeah, no, they don't. No, they don't. Okay, that's not that they're rejecting me. They they may even act like they reject me. That Jehovah's Witnesses have gone out of their way to do so, um, but they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting what God said. Therefore, they're rejecting God. They aren't. They aren't going to admit to that. There's no way they would admit to that. And frankly, I don't care. That's not my issue. When I stand before God, he's not going to say, how many people from different cults did you lead to Christ? And I say, none. Oh, you did a horrible job. If I tell them what God tells me to tell them when he tells me to tell them, then I will hear it well done, good and faithful servant. Okay. They aren't rejecting me. They're rejecting God. You might have the same thing. And, and you may not be called to talk to people in cults. Boy. Um, actually, Dino, can you clean these for me real quick? You don't need to see them. Those things are horrible. They can't do anything to God, so that's why they take it out. Well, I agree. I agree. And, and you know, that's why we're getting into verses 9 and following. We're going to see that it has nothing to do with that. I can't I can't legitimately say that I have led too many to Christ, maybe three, four in my whole life. One of them 
one of them sitting right here today, and I'm I'm proud to be the one. Well, I, I say that carefully. I hope you understand what I mean by that. I'm proud to be able to say that God worked through me to bring this one person to Christ. What a tremendous thing! It does my heart good. And, and the first person that I led to Christ was my son. And then the first person that I ever baptized was right here, my son. The first person I ever did these things with, a lot of things with, was my son. And he's sitting right here able to teach. You know, for example, on, on Sunday nights he was into the rotation while he was here and whatnot. You know, what a tremendous thing. But had he not, it wouldn't be that he was rejecting me. Not at all. I have children who aren't walking with God right now. Quite honestly. I have a relatively good relationship with them. You know, I, I don't talk to them as much as I would like to talk to them. Thank you very much. I don't talk to them as much as I would like to talk to them uh, and communicate with them the way probably we really should. But I have a really good relationship with them because though they haven't agreed to follow Christ, they haven't rejected me. It's not between me and them. It's between them and God. Okay, There's the difference. Now, now we get into what it says in verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. There is a new subject. Okay, But it's not entirely a new subject. And you'll understand what I mean by that in a moment. He's gone through some of the difficulties um, that they've had to go through and express to them, this is what you guys will probably have to go through as well. Okay. He's told them of the need for proper church leadership and the kind of love that's supposed to flow. Now, he's gone to a slightly different angle on it. He starts off with one term, and that's brotherly love. What kind of love is brotherly love? Now, if he said sisterly love, I wouldn't know. I have no sisters. Thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> uh, I I know that, and, and there's girls that, well, like uh, Tiffany Simpson, uh, well, not Simpson anymore, but different ones like that that said, I'd be your sister, I'll be your sister. Uh, brotherly love is the kind of love that a Christian should have for a Christian. At first, now, he's not talking about the kind of love that tells me I need to go to these people or I don't love them properly and lead them to Christ. This is brotherly love, the kind I have between, we'll say, myself and Jeff, my brother. I should have toward each of the people who are part of the body of Christ. It shouldn't really be any different. Well, isn't it a little different because he's blood? Yeah, in a, in a sense, kind of. But I should be just as happy to see a fellow believer as I am to see my brother. I should be just as happy to communicate with a fellow believer, as I am with my brother. Now, my brother and I typically will talk some, sometimes up to four times a week. Lately, because of his schedule, that hasn't necessarily been the case, and he doesn't always have decent access to phone 
what do they call it? Um, where your phone picks up in a certain place. Cell phones have, have changed the way we do things, and, and so that makes it a little tougher. Talking about that, we don't know who's pretending and who's not. We may have an idea. I would suggest there's people who come here on Sunday mornings that are kind of playing games with it. I'm not going to point fingers and name names and all this kind of stuff. That's not my not my thing. There are other ones that come that I would suggest are real, honest to goodness Christians that come not for the social aspect as much as to grow in, in Christ. And I've seen it quite a bit. We've had people that constitute the core of this church, so to speak, that I would say are definitely believers. Now, in that regard, the ones... I'm going to put it this way, and I think we need to do this kind of carefully because I think it can potentially be hazardous, yet I think it needs to be done this way. The ones that are the core of the church, so to speak, in this specific regard, need to be dealt with a little differently than those that aren't. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying that way. I would not go to those that constitute the core of this church and try to lead them to Christ. I would not say things that would indicate they need to be led to Christ, to them specifically. Okay? There are other ones that kind of need that. You know, it, basically asking the question, you say you're saved, okay, based on what? You know, that line of thought. Uh, this is talking about real believers. Now, how do I love them the way God tells me I'm supposed to love them? With a brotherly love that is consistent with that which we know. He isn't telling us something that we have to stop and try to figure out. He's not. People try to make the Bible a puzzle too much. Well, there's three different words for love, so uh, we've got to figure out which one he's talking about. No. Look at the context, see what it says, and then do it. Stop making it a puzzle. That's the whole thing. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. Why? My guess is that they were doing it. Okay. Why was he writing to them then? I know that's really bad English and I don't care. Why then was he writing to them? I'll put it that way. I believe one reason. The same reason he started out writing this book. Not because they were in error, but to encourage them to continue on. To encourage them to continue on. That is the reason why he brought it up. Could he have left it out? Well, 
Yeah. Hey, you have no need. You have no need that I'd write it to you. So he could have potentially left it out, and it wouldn't have mattered. Might I suggest it was also for our good because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit knew that we would need it today just as much as they needed it then. We must think about these things. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. What in the world would he be talking about there? Just this week, I heard it, and it was blatant. People talking about love. And I will only be able to classify it this way. It was the world's version of love. It was on the Christian radio station by somebody, I'm assuming at least claims to be a Christian, you would all know the name if I said it. But talking about love, and it wasn't love at all, it was lust. And talking about how it's so easy for a person to say, I love you, and then fall out of love. Real love doesn't do that. Lust is what does that. It, it just is. We might condition ourselves to believe that it's love. But we must watch what we're what we're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. If if a brother does something that I know is wrong, and I have no doubt to that regard, and this confirms what you're saying, I'm not called to not love him. I am, however, called to not love the sin. Okay? I am called, I could show you in Scripture, to distance myself from that sin. There's a little thing that I think we often forget about when it comes to brotherly love. That if I accept, condone, or encourage my brother to do something that is wrong, or as they've termed it these days, to be an enabler. Then I am the I'm not loving that brother the way I'm supposed to love that brother, for one thing. And for another thing, it is probable, probable that I will fall into the same thing. Maybe not to that extent. And it, I'm not saying that it has to happen that way. I say probable. Purposely. Because if they're doing something wrong and I just jump in and I'm right in there with them, I like the way Chuck Swindoll put it. You go out and work in the garden with brand new gloves and the dirt doesn't get glovey, the gloves get dirty. You know, uh, <laughs> there's, 
That's well put. I mean, it sounds a little goofy, but it's well put. You know, the dirt gets on what is clean and infests it. Not the clean gets on what is dirty and changes that. So to condone and to encourage and to, oh, it's okay, about any type of sin, I find myself in a bad strait. That's not brotherly love. That is not brotherly love. If I do that, then I'm wrong. Now, that's not to say that I can't have a brother that's doing something wrong and still associate with him. That's my brother. You know, uh, I, he doesn't. But let me put it this way. If Jeff was to be a complete stoner, <laughs> I would say, that's my brother. I would claim him as my brother. And I would be expected to love him as my brother. But it would drastically alter my relationship with him because I wouldn't be able to do things around that. Thankfully, he's one of the most respectable people I think you'll ever find walking the face of this planet. He has his issues like anybody else does, but oh well, I guess. That's in case he ever hears, happens to hear this. I've told him about it. i got to protect myself. <laughs> he may be my little brother, but he's bigger brother, too. <laughs> he can work me over with one hand tied behind his back. Okay. Maybe because you're one handed already. Yes. Uh, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. How are we taught by God? The only way we can be taught by God, the only way we can be taught by God is to have him living within us. How to love. The world's love is not love. It's lust. Investigate it. You'll see that that's truth. Read about it in Scripture. You'll see that it tells you the same thing. I'm not making this stuff up. I've seen God's Word displayed in the lives of people that indicate that it's correct when it says that it's lust. There's a couple of different types of lust, and those are the ones that are explicitly called love. Now, clear to the extent of, I love ice cream. No, I really don't. I want some. Not right now. I mean, Dinah, keep your seat. You don't have to go to the store. <laughs> Let's put it honestly, though. What, do, what is my involvement with ice cream? That it would gratify me. That it would take care of something that I want. And I say I love it. There's a light grade example of it right there. It's something that I want to gratify myself, calling it love, when really it's what? Lust. And that's what Scripture's talking about time after time after time. But when it's God's love displayed, it is the kind of love that wants nothing more than the absolute best for my fellow believers. I want to build them up. I want to help them. I'm using, there's a lot in this that I can illustrate with my relationship with my brother because it's talking about this kind of love. Okay, he lives in a less than favorable condition for most people. Okay. One of the things that I have been trying to get accomplished and it's not going as quick and easy as I'd hoped is to get him an electrical system that will work with no electrical system okay <laughs> uh, he's constantly running out of power and having to run a generator 
and then they burn up, and then he has to drive 140, 150 miles round trip to replace it. And, you know, this just goes on and on and on, and he's been doing this for years now, okay? I want the best for my brother. I want him to have that hardship in his life relieved. Therefore, I'm working on a wind-powered generator that will charge his whole system and his house whenever the wind's blowing. Oh. Well, yeah, 99.999 percent of the time it's that way. Um, but, <laughs> but seriously, it's because I want what's best for him. Okay? Now that's the kind of brotherly love that this is referring to right here. I want to take a hardship that you might be having as a believer. Do what I can to eliminate that from your life and help you have a better life because of it. And I hope you understand what I'm saying by that. It's not me doing the work, it's God working through me. Okay, that's, I'm not standing up here blowing my horn. I'm using myself because I'm not going to point to, you know, you, blah, blah. You know, maybe we would be a better way to put it. But that's what we need to be doing. To love the way God intended love to be. What is God's love toward us? There's a love that he displayed. While I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. That's a specific type of love. Love that says, I don't care, I want, I want you to have every opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's one of the types of love we need to display in our lives. Now that I am saved, not that his love changed, but he doesn't need to save me anymore. Now, his love says, I want nothing but the best. For you. Now it's brotherly love displayed. Okay. That's what it's talking about right there. The only way we can do that, the only way we can do it is through God. Because He is love. You don't believe it? Read First John. You can't get through First John and not see that God is love. How is God love? By character. There's nothing he is that's outside of love. Nothing. Well, what if it means that people are going to go to a place of eternal torment? That's not because he didn't love them. It's because they chose it. It's, it has nothing to do with God's love. He is love. I mean, we could go down the line. That's the kind of love that we must begin to display or we will never make it as a church. Verse 10, And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. Go, let her rip. The word of God. Absolutely. We must get to know it. And, and boy, here, this is going to be a two-verse morning. One last week, two this week. I wonder if we'll get three next. Uh, this is some, I mean, it looks so, so basic. But it's really not when we look at it. That's, that's absolutely right. How can we get to know but to pray? And communicate with God. And then read the word of God and have him communicate with us. We must have that open relationship between us and God or we'll never know how to love the fellow believers. And it's not just, 
Okay, I'm going to change the wording a little bit. It's not just the people in Happy Camp. It's people all over that are believers. When we were talking about love earlier, we were talking about love that brings people to a saving knowledge of Christ. Now we're talking about love once they're brought to Christ, how to give them everything you got. What a what a tremendous thought. And indeed you all you do all indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. Okay, then why in the world would he re write this to them? If they're already doing it, why would he write this? Finish verse 10. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. That is the reason. We urge you that you increase more and more. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I do love the believers that come to this church. Good. I hope you do. That is the epitome of Christianity played out in Christianity. Okay? It's not what... You'll never find a cult that does the same thing. They may be real nice. They can, there's some great people that are in cults but they'll never have the love that's expressed here. Never. We can easily say, if we have God living within us, and it should be this way, we can easily say, I have love being produced in and through me because of God who is in me, working through me. Okay? So are you content there? Are you content? Let me ask this. And, and I know it's not the same exactly, but it's kind of the same. And I hope you'll understand where I'm going with it. Some people ate breakfast this morning. For those that didn't, you probably ate dinner last night. Okay. May have been good, may have not turned out quite so good. Some people are better cooks than others. But it was good enough that you're thinking, I may eat something again this afternoon after church. Why? Because though you ate and were completely satisfied, you're not content with that. <laughs> now you need more. <laughs> Why not with doing this? All oh, that we would not become content, but what? More. I want more this afternoon. I want more this evening. Boy, I can hardly wait to see what's more for bedtime snack, for breakfast in the morning. If you don't think that matters to you, have a fasting blood draw out in Wairika at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning and see how happy you are about 10 minutes before your appointment time and you're still waiting and your stomach's growling and you wish you could have ate something and you couldn't since 12 hours ago. Okay. Okay. Do you, you, you understand what I'm saying with that though? You know, this is stuff that we don't think about in regards to love. But why? I should be wanting more love for my fellow believers. God's already teaching me to do it. But all oh, that I would increase more and more. I shouldn't have to have somebody tell me 
to increase more and more. That should be the natural desire that I have. Because again, God lives in me. And he is love. Therefore, how can I not love? I should want more. Just like I want more love for non-Christians that would display that aspect of God's love. You know, the only, the only kind of interpersonal relationship that is not covered, per se, in, in Scripture when it comes to love is that of a child and a parent, because that's a given. The, the parent loves the child. The child may or may not love that parent. Doesn't matter. The parent loves that child. No, well, not so much anymore. <laughs> I mean, they're killing them left and right. But uh, matter of fact, was it New York that okayed uh, post-birth abortion or whatever they call that now? Is that where it was? New York. New York. Yeah, what, what a tragedy. Yeah. Well, they, they know nothing of love. That's a given. But the reason, let me, let me get back to that. The reason why they don't have that relationship is because it's so well displayed in Christ's love for us where it came to the cross. And, you know, God the Father, being our Father, is love. We don't have to worry about that. He's teaching us time after time after time that relationship that we need to have, that love we need to have between ourselves and fellow believers and ourselves and the lost. Those two are highly critical to the life of a believer. We will never, ever, ever have a testimony before the lost if we don't have that. We can't. It will not be that way. We, it, it is impossible to say, I love God. And, love, and not love others. If you don't believe it, again, read First John. I, if we had time to do it, I'd turn to there now and, and show it. If you say that you love and you don't love your brother, you're a liar, it says. Are you calling me a liar? Yes, absolutely. Because the word of God does. If we don't, then we're a liar. How do you get around it? We must develop this love one for another. It's got to be there. Well, they don't always think the way I think. I don't care. God doesn't care. That's not critical of that. Do I have to absolutely agree with my brother? I hope not. I've got one brother that I have some kind of differences with. But boy, does it do me good when he calls. I never know when to call him, so I leave it up to him. And and he's fine with that, you know. I told him if I needed to, I'd just text him, and he'd call me. But you, know, you don't have to have exact minds like minds to do that. He's a city boy, I'm not. I got a brother that would gladly go fishing with me or hunting with me or hiking with me or biking with me or you know, camping or whatever and the other one, eh, not so much. He's not really inclined that way. He's more of a city boy. And that's good. That, that's fine. I'm not knocking him for that. It's just I don't have to have that exact ideas that he has in order for that relationship to work because there's something bigger than that and that's called love. So let's put that into this. Do I have to absolutely agree with everything that anybody thinks about the Bible or Christianity because they're my brother in Christ? No. 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 Does it have to induce hate? Absolutely not. Well, if it does, 
then I have switched from love to lust. If it changes me because of that difference of ideas, then all I'm in it for is for him to think like me, or her, or whatever, that person to think like me. And I've done nothing more than began to lust for that. And I no longer love. These are critical thoughts. I understand the Bible is absolute. Okay. But we all live different lives. And we see from the Bible what makes our life more livable. Yep. Even though there are other things in the Bible that other people take from it. And the Bible is absolute. There's, There's no, no denying it. But the parts that I remember are the parts that affect me. Think, and, think of it this way, Ruby. There are, there is only one sole interpretation of Scripture. But there is a myriad of application of Scripture. You're going to apply it to your life differently than I'll apply it to mine, most likely because you don't live me. <laughs> you need to think what you're told to think. No. <laughs> that was a joke. No. Uh, Yeah. And, and the like you said, are different. Well, let, we're going to end with this with this thought right here, and and you're absolutely right, Ruby. But we're going to end with this thought: you're either loving or lusting, and it's one or the other. If it's lust, it's probably power related. If it's love, it's humility. That's what God wants in us. I don't need to be lifted up. You do. And I'll do everything I can to help you. That means you think you're better than me. No, it doesn't. No, it does not. It means I want the best for you. Doesn't matter about me. What about you? Other people are going to look at me and say, if they love me the way they're supposed to, they're going to say, you know, I want the best for you and I'll do everything I can to lift you up. And I need that. But it's not my job to lift me up. It's my job to lift you up. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying with that. I'm not... Boy, some of this stuff can go completely wrong if it's not taken in its proper sense. And sometimes I don't know if I get it out that way or not. We've got to wrap this up. We're basically past time already by the clock back there. And I've completely lost my watch. I think it might be someplace in my room. And so I don't have that to go by. Uh huh? Yeah, uh, but so I have to go by the clock, and therefore I'm, I'm saying we're about we're we're past time. We've got to stop this. But oh, don't don't take this wrong. I just want nothing more than for us to learn to love the way God wants us to love. Oh, that to me that would be the epitome. But not just talking about for fellow Christians, like we've been talking about this morning, but also for the non-Christians as well. That we need to love the way God loved them. Then we're doing what He said. You know, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then what? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not that hard. But there's some unlovable people. Yeah. Go look in the mirror. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I don't want this to be a pep rally, but let's do it. Let's get out there and do it. Let's learn to love the way we're supposed to love. Get in the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Love the way God tells us to, and then let Him work in our lives. Lord, 
thank you for the love that brought you here for us rotten sinners that you died for so that we could live Lord thank you that you dwell in us thank you that you love through us teach us the kind of love you want us to show help us to grow help us to be more like you that way help us to love one another as you have loved us. We thank you for what you're going to do in your name. Amen.